the auteur, a romantic notion around the will of the artist. The idea that a single great mind is the sole progenitor of a grand work. Everything else, everyone else, are little more than tools for use to extract miraculous visions, these seeds of eternal beauty for the right singular vision to plant upon a great canvas. I can't stand this concept. The idea that an artistic development, big or small, lives or dies on a single genius savant, to me, is kind of bollocks. Because the truth is a lot more complicated than that. It's a confusion of the critical importance of a cohesive vision for a project with the individual input deemed essential to make it. Many minds are required to bring something to life, even if not all of them contribute directly to the art itself, but it is very indicative of unconscious biases that underlie the critical reception of a thing, and how we describe it to others. I've been thinking about this in relation to playing Immortality, the latest game from the makers of Her Story and Telling Lies. It's, well, it's more of the same, really. A lovingly prepared, multi-layered narrative told through disparate pieces of live-action footage, where the player's job is to figure out what the hell is going on, at their own pace, drawing their own conclusions, with their only cues being a sequence of brilliantly performed vignettes that inevitably tie together in one way or another. But there's something else going on here. A conversation in the peripheries that has led me to take stock of the way I think about art, about the people who make it, and why we have such a problem giving credit to anyone other than those at the centre of the frame. Immortality consists of interviews, behind-the-scenes footage, and excerpts from the three unreleased films that enigmatic actress Marissa Marcel starred in. It's fiction, of course, but a very convincing one. These films span different annals of cinematic history, looking and feeling like they were genuinely plucked from those eras. This manufactured authenticity is a huge part of the magic of this game, and, as it transpires, an essential function of the story that is being told. Your job as the player is to work out what happened to Marissa, why these films never saw the light of day, and what sinister forces lie hidden within the celluloid. It's a compelling setup that spawns forth a myriad of plot threads, some easily grasped, others positively Lynchian in their presentation, all of which can be drawn from the screen in one way or another. While the primary method of interaction in her story and telling lies was the ascertaining of keywords to type into a search bar, in Immortality you're utilising a sort of AI program that is on the lookout for faces. Faces let you find links between these three films, the common threads, persons of interest, and perhaps some connections one otherwise would not have made. It also recognises paintings and props too, and perhaps we should pin that fact for a later discussion. There is some truly insidious stuff going on behind the scenes. Shocking revelation awaits, should you dig deep. But what struck me was that this method of connection made me reflect on something more grounded, something that reverberates out into our world. It acknowledges the importance of those beyond the frame. Immortality, by very precise and intentional design, is a story about the price, or rather I should say the cost, of creative perfection, and how those involved aren't always invited to share in the accolades. People like this guy. When was the last time you properly sat still and read the closing credits of a film? I know that the omnipresent behemoth that is the Marvel Cinematic Universe has found an ingenious way to keep bums in seats long after the story's denouement, making its audience a sea of stubborn brats forced to eat their vegetables before they're allowed to find out if Blorco is going to turn up in the next Doctor Strange, but no real effort has actually been made to make us want to pay attention to this ocean of names that floods across an often jet black screen. It's a concession not a celebration. Without faces, names are just names. I know that's a frankly stupid way to put it, but it speaks to a truth I think many are unwilling to openly admit. Do you really care who the key grip is? 
or the best boy, or the second AD? Would you care more if you already knew them? If you could look into their eyes? I don't think this lack of admiration for all and sundry is necessarily disrespectful. It's an impossibility to give conscious thought to every single person who worked on something you love. Maybe you don't consider aspects like the marketing team or the distribution network all that crucial to the artistic vision. And maybe that's missing the point of how critical these elements of creation are to ensuring that you get to see this thing in the first place. But the onus here, instead, is on the people centre stage to acknowledge and recognise the work that's being put in by those around them, and not simply splash their might-as-well-be-anonymous identity across the closing moments, a reluctant affirmation after the money shot. Games, too, have this phenomenon, made worse still by the fact that a lot of folk don't actually make it to the credits. These things are bigger in scope, often much longer, and with barriers to completion that can stop many in their tracks. In Immortality's case, I know anecdotally that there are credits, but at the time of writing I haven't yet reached them. I don't actually know how to reach them. That's one of the game's great mysteries, and it's created a barrier between me and the individual people who made it. All I have to go on from the start is the united front of the creative team, a snazzy logo on the splash screen. Immortality was made by Half Mermaid, a studio run by creative director Sam Barlow. You probably know his name already. It's the one plastered over previews, reviews, and accolades. He made her story a Scorsese for a new medium, and someone who is often attributed in the media as the great solitary builder of these interactive experiences. It's a pedestal he doesn't seem that rushed to get off of. And you might not necessarily gauge that from his media presentation alone. In a review for Inverse, writer Willa Rowe notes that in the press pack for the game, alongside high quality stills of his cast and other generous pieces of key art, his is the only headshot offered up, not any of the other members of Half Mermaid, Willa writes, In a game whose credits are filled with cast and crew for three movies that people actually had to film, produce, and edit, the only person who has a face is Sam Barlow. This is a strange part of the puzzle, a reality that seems very at odds with the message of the art. Without further context, it's hard to say if this is an intentional focus or just an ignorant mistake. It certainly isn't the message I got from the game in isolation. But upon reading this passage, going back to the tapestry of filmic treats, which in its presentation alone identifies clearly who these people are, it's obvious that Half Mermaid wants you to acknowledge these brief glimpses of the builders. All those snapping shut the clapperboards, providing makeup and wardrobe, and building the sets. Remember those props that got the same amount of attention from the machine as the human beings that brought them together in frame? Every presence is acknowledged, catalogued, and identified in game. But beyond, it's been surprisingly hard to find information on who these people are. Their names will inevitably adorn the screen at the fable's close, but with a hearty helping of context ripped out, removed unceremoniously until they are but mere peons, the grunts who do the dirty work to ensure that the stars truly shine. And I have to wonder about these brief moments where we see the film crew on screen. Are these people just actors? Are they the actual crew who filmed these sequences? Or does the truth lie somewhere in between? These quickly familiar faces ended up becoming a melancholic rogues gallery during my time with the game. Often the first faces seen during each clip, but so easily lost in the thrall of investigation. A lot of footage unwittingly starts in the midst, cutting off our opportunity for a relationship with these people unless we make a point of winding back to the start before we move on. Be kind. Rewind, so to speak. This makes it all too easy to miss the subtleties at play that tell us they aren't just spectres, a necessary evil to be forgotten once the goals have been achieved, snipped away and left upon the cutting room floor, and that they are just as affected by the trials and tribulations of film production as our doomed lead artists. And again, all this, as I have presented, is clearly an aspect of very intentional design by Half Mermaid. 
That's the story they are trying to tell, even if it's not necessarily one that resonates with the veneration of their real-world counterparts. Who gets to be immortal? Why do we see so much of the world as a hierarchy of value? That some individuals are irreplaceable while others are not? Is a more valid truth not that the combined effort is what makes something what it is? I'm reluctant to call this callous narcissism. It's a problem that both artist and audience are party to, much like when Hideo Kojima described Death Stranding as a title he made by himself, despite the fact that he very much fucking didn't. It's short-sightedness at best, a miscommunication from someone who would be otherwise well-meaning. Barlow knows what's important about telling these stories. Immortality presents it so in plain text, much as the film crew we catch bare glimpses of in-game might be merely actors playing the part, in a sort of cursed simulacrum of a meta-reality, someone did actually have to film these scenes. Someone had to do the camera work, someone made the sets, designed the costumes, scored an eerily beautiful soundtrack. The sound design in general is integral to the game's central mechanic, someone had to tweak that just right to ensure that players could catch on without beating them over the head with it. Someone had to code the game. Someone had to build the press kits and edit the trailer and organise the API for the digital storefront prior to launch. All great work is built off the blood and sweat of folk rarely acknowledged well for their efforts. This is everything I see plastered across my screen as I scroll through this archaic footage of films that simultaneously do and don't exist. I just wish we were better at acknowledging these things beyond the screen too. I should note, I don't actually know anything about the work practices of Half a Mermaid, and unless identified otherwise, I have no reason to assume that anyone was badly treated during the production of this game. And it may be that Barlow himself is uncomfortable with how we describe his importance in the creation of it. It's a two-way street, after all, and media allowing itself to be wrapped up in the mythology of the omnipotent creator doesn't help the cause. It's a misnomer to suggest that we can create things alone, because we're never really truly alone. Our friends, our colleagues, our family and allies, they might not be something we commit to the canvas, nor the people we feature on screens, silver or otherwise, but they're all there. Our sources of inspiration, our support networks, our driving force that compels us to keep going until the work is done, no man is an island, no artist adrift at sea. We are the total sum of all our life experiences, all those whose lives we touched and in turn were touched by. And I think that, beyond anything else, is something that should be celebrated, in frame and out.